Are we ready? We are ready. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all to our services this morning. Good to see all of you here today. Uh, as we begin this morning, I have Pastor Bob going to bring us an announcement and explanation. So. Well, a lot of you weren't expecting to see me today, but here I am. Uh, that's the announcement. No. Uh, as you know, we, um, we had announced last Sunday about um, a pastoral candidate, and um, um, I, uh, after I'd, I'd got home uh, back to Prescott Valley Sunday, I called to uh, talk to him and, um, and um, found out that uh, he had... Um, decided that it felt like the Lord was telling me that this is not the direction to go. And, um, and I, um, you know, he was apologizing and so forth. And I said, well, you don't need to apologize. I mean, I, I was going to tell him, I, I told him, I said, I was going to say to you that you need to make sure that this is God's will, that you don't move forward until you know it's the Lord's will. And, um, and so I, I, I'm saying all that to say that um, a part of the process that we have within within the Church of the Nazarene is um, is of course the candidate, the the pastoral candidate, has to feel it's God's will. Uh, the church has to feel it's God's will. The district superintendent has to feel it's God's will. So we have kind of some checks and balances that uh, that we work through uh, to try to make sure that we know that what we're doing is is the will of God. Now I admit that sometimes maybe. We miss some things along the way, but but that is, I think, a good process. And um, and I just want you to to realize that it has nothing to do with you. Uh, we are we are seeking, and I know you're seeking to know what God's will is for the future leadership of this church. Amen. Amen. And so uh, let's uh, let's just keep uh, believing, keep praying, and um, and just put up with me for a little while longer. Okay. And uh, but it's good to be able to be here with you and to worship with you and to share with you and you um uh, i do nothing but brag on you so um uh uh you you're 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 a delight to be able to to minister to and i thank god for the opportunity uh to be able to do that so let's join together in worship and trust as we believe in the lord and what god has in store for us in these days god bless thank you we did try to get word out uh, through our email uh, system but some of you may not have been notified i hope you didn't show up if you did there was a sign on the door <laughs> but anyway uh do keep praying that god will bring us to the right place one other quick announcement next sunday is the second sunday and on that uh, sunday on sunday evenings we meet for our hymn sing and a pastor will be uh preaching to us also so remember that next sunday would you stand with us as we begin our service this morning we're going to sing are you washed in the blood Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you Are you washed in the blood 
aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean, are ye washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are ye washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Now that's a question for you this morning. And you kind of need to have that answer before the end of the service. We're going to be taking communion together this morning. And this next song just reminds us of the price that was paid on Calvary's cross for our salvation.
Yes, the blood is my victory. seated. At this time, we'll prepare to uh, receive our morning offering, if the uh, ushers would prepare at this time and uh, come forward. <laughs> we will prepare for the offering, and Sharon will uh, bring us an offertory this morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the blood of Jesus shed for us on Calvary's cross. What a great sacrifice that we might live in relationship with you. Would you bless this offering, Father? Use it for its intended purposes. May it uh, perform as you would have it perform in helping those around us, helping those around the world, and keeping us strong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sharon, he made something beautiful out of my life. Would you stand with us again as we sing together? We are this morning going to be gathering at the end of the service for the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. So sing with us the table. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table the Lord, I won't hunger anymore at His table. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table.
There is healing at the table of the Lord. There is healing at the table of the Lord. And I won't suffer anymore at his table. Come and plan His yoke is easy His burden lies He is able He will restore At the table Of the Lord Come all ye weary Come and Let's join our hearts in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege that we have today to be able to come into your presence. Lord, we don't, uh, we don't take this for granted. But Father, we thank you that you are here this morning. And we want to honor you and, and honor your presence with us as we, um, as we want to hear from you. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing in music and the worship uh, time together. Thank you for the opportunity that we had uh, this morning to share in our offerings and our gifts as we give back to you in worship. We thank you, dear God, this morning as we come, uh, dear Lord, to bring to you the needs and requests and the concerns that we have, dear God. Um, uh, we realize this morning, Father, that we are a needy people. And we pray your special touch. We think today, dear God, of uh, Joanne Lane, who is uh, uh, has still uh, in the hospital after surgery uh, this past week. And we pray that your hand will be upon her. We're trusting that she'll be able to be released from the hospital uh, there in Las Vegas today and that uh, she and Larry will be able to make it home. We pray that your hand would be upon them and be, uh, dear Lord, especially near uh, uh, to her and, and to him as well today. We thank you, dear Lord, for um, the fact that Judy is able to be in the service this morning. We've been praying for her. We pray, dear God, that your special touch, dear God, would be upon others. Uh, we know there's some who are not here who are not feeling well. We pray your touch upon them. Uh, we pray, dear Lord, today for, for Jan, and, and uh, we pray for David. We know that uh, he's not doing well, and we pray that your hand would be in this situation. You'll continue to strengthen Jan and just help her, dear God, to feel you especially near. We thank you this morning, Lord, that we can bring our needs to you. You tell us, dear God, in your word that we are to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And so we come this morning to place those before you, to put our faith and our trust in you this morning and for what you have in store for us. Lord, we want to pray for uh, uh, our church during this time of, of searching, dear God, for your will, for the future pastoral leadership of this church. We know, dear God, that you have the right person that you're going to reveal to us at the right time. And we pray, dear God, that you will just help us this morning. We know that uh, uh, for some of us, we're a little disappointed that things had not worked out the other way. But Lord, we realize that's just us and our human nature. But Lord, we pray today that you'll give leadership and direction and wisdom 
uh, to our district superintendent, to our church board, uh, dear Lord, to help, uh, dear Lord, to find that person that uh, you have already, dear Lord, placed your hand upon. We believe that, and we pray that you would just reveal your special plan for, for this church in the days that are ahead. We thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to worship you together. We pray, dear God, that you would just speak to our hearts as we look at your word this morning. And may, dear God, you impart to us your truth that will help us, dear Lord, to walk closer to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Well, it is good to be able to, uh, to be with you again this morning, as I uh, just mentioned earlier. Um, you thought you were going to not have to put up with me this Sunday, but uh, uh, God had other things in store. Uh, so here, here I am. <laughs> and uh, I'm delighted to be able to be here and, and to share with you. And uh, uh, I believe that God, uh, you know, I, I just know that God has, um, has his plans and, um, and uh, I've, I've learned, um, as I spent um, uh, 20 years um, uh, as a district superintendent and helping churches find pastors, that I, I discovered that, um, you know, uh, the main thing that we sought during all that time was to try to find the will of the Lord. And uh, it's not always uh, easy for us. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, we, got, we have our own ideas. And uh, have you noticed how sometimes... Your ideas kind of come in conflict with God's plans, um, and uh, so we just have to let God help us to clear all these things out so that we can discover what He has in store for us. So here we are this morning, and, and we're going to continue the series uh, that I've been sharing with you on, on becoming a Romans 12 Christian and uh, talking about, you know, what's the right path for our journey towards true spirituality. And this morning... We're going to be looking at the, at the fifth message, and um, uh, we have one more to go, so uh, uh, just hang in there. And uh, this morning, we're going to learn how to experience authentic community. We're going to look at this through the relationship of David and Jonathan as found in 1 Samuel chapters 18 through 20. There was an article that came out in the Chicago Tribune by uh, a writer by the name of Marla Paul. She was chronicling about uh, her journey and her sadness and her disappointment and inability, basically, to, uh, uh, to sustain meaningful relationships. After the article came out in the paper, there was a flood of, of uh, responses of people sending her letters and emails, uh, and one lady wrote to her, and she said, I often feel like I'm standing outside looking through a window at a party to which I'm not invited. That's an interesting uh, uh, picture, isn't it? I think some of us could probably identify with that. H have you ever felt like, uh, uh, felt like maybe you feel like you're, you're going through life, but you're missing the real action, uh, the real connection? You see people laughing and, and doing stuff, but you feel like there's kind of an invisible bubble around you, and everyone might think you've all, you got it all together, but... Uh, but you really are, you, you feel very, very lonely. At the end of the article, uh, Marla Paul said, sometimes it seems easier to give up and to accept disconnectedness as a dark and unshakable companion, but that's not the companion I want, so I will persevere, unquote. And I think for some of you, yeah, this may describe how you feel today, and we're going to talk about how to get connected from the heart with people, but the, the reality is you've got to persevere. I mean, you've got to do something about it. Robert Putman in his classic book, Bowling Alone, identifies that the number one need in America today and, and what he calls, he, he refers to loneliness as the new American epidemic. It's interesting, isn't it? Because never in the history of the world have people been able to communicate as much and yet be uh, so, uh, disconnected so, or, or connected rather so little. You know, we've got email and voicemail and Blackberries and smartphones and faxes and video conferencing and Zoom and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We have all of that. And, and, and yet, uh, if you want to communicate, you can, and yet people are still feeling disconnected. 
Do you realize that last year there were more suicides than there were homicides in America? As a matter of fact, it was nearly twice as many suicides as homicides. We hear a lot about people being killed, but the reality is there's a greater epidemic, and that is that these people who gave up and basically concluded that life wasn't worth living. They were, they were so alone or they're so depressed. Among men, they say that less than 10% of men in America have a true best friend. That is another man that they can really share life with. Oh, they can drink a couple of beers or watch a ball game or play some golf or hit some tennis balls. But it, when, when it comes down to real life, less than one out of 10 men in America have a true friend. And unfortunately, in this city and across America and often around the world, in the place that God designed for there to be authentic community, it isn't happening. People walk into a room like this, they sing some songs, they sit down, they listen for a while, they get up and they walk out alone. And we call it church. But that's the experience that the great majority of Americans are having today. So the question this morning we're going to look at is how do we experience authentic community? Now, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at, uh, at the life of Jonathan and David as, as Jonathan and David model for us how to experience this authentic community. Now, so let's, let's think a little bit about, about the background. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, you will read where God spoke to the prophet Samuel and, and basically said to Samuel, I'm disappointed in Saul that, uh, that I had you anoint to be king. And so I want you to go and anoint someone else to be king over Israel. And so Samuel, in obedience to, to, to the Lord, uh, went to the town of Bethlehem, went to a man by the name of Jesse, and, and said to, to him, I want to I see your sons. And so uh, Jesse brought his sons before Samuel. And as Samuel kind of went through the, the, uh, the, all the, the, the sons and nothing really, uh, God didn't speak to him about any of those. And then finally he says, don't you have any other sons? He said, well, I've got my youngest son, David, but he's out in the field shepherding the sheep. And he said, well, bring him back and, 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 and let me see him. And when David came, God uh, basically identified that this was to be the new king of Israel. And so Samuel anoints David, the shepherd boy, to be the king of Israel. Now, in, 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 verse, uh, in chapter 17, we read this story that all of us are familiar with, with, with David, that, that uh, Jesse, his father, uh, you know, his brothers were, were fighting in the, in, in the, uh, the army of Israel, and, uh, and they were lined up and encamped uh, against the Philistines. And so Jesse was concerned about what was going on. And so he sent David to take some food and to check on what was, what was happening with, uh, with his, uh, his sons. And, and when he got there, he discovered that uh, the, the nation of Israel, as they'd drawn up these lines against the Philistines, that the Philistines had a man by the name of Goliath, who was nine feet tall, that basically was making fun of the army of Israel and saying to them, send somebody out to fight against me and the one who wins, that one will be the, will, will be the ruler over, over the other nation. And, and so as, you, as, you, as he discovered, no one was willing to go and fight Goliath and David, the little shepherd boy, said, I'll do it. And you know the story. He goes through the stream, gets five smooth stones and with his sling and he goes out and pulls out the first stone and sends it and hits Goliath in the forehead and kills him and he takes off his head and David becomes a national hero until people were exclaiming, you know, that David's uh, uh, great, great uh, victory at that time. Now, Jonathan, on the other hand, was the king's son. He, he was the heir to the throne. He was, uh, he was kind of in a privileged position. So it's, it's very interesting when you look at the background of these two, a shepherd boy and the son of the king, and, and yet we, we find a relationship that, that develops there. And from the relationship of David and Jonathan, this morning we learn seven essentials, I believe, for biblical community. The first essential that we find is that, that we need to beware 
uh, 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 of what, uh, what God has in store for us. So you realize that God orchestrates circumstances and God orchestrates chemistry. In chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now, folks, just understand this morning that sometimes we miss the greatest people that God wants to put into our life because we have, we've kind of got an unconscious filter about the kind of people that you'll really connect with. But we need to be aware that God might bring the very best friend you'll ever have from a different socioeconomic, ethnic, or even an age background, but you've got to be open. You've got to be aware of what God is, is doing. And the second thing is you need to be intentional. You see, because we rarely drift into authentic community. In chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, it says, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his, uh, his sword and his bow and his belt. And the reality is, as we look at that, you don't just drift into friendships. Making deep friendships, make, having authentic community really has to be a priority. Notice here that Jonathan pursued David. He saw something in David's heart and he said he saw something in his life and he, he basically saw something about David and said, I, I, I want to get to know him better. There was just something about David's walk with God. In, in, uh, in, in verse 1, the New American Standard Bible says that this way, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. It, it wasn't something they produced or something that they made happen, but, but God basically orchestrated the chemistry there. And I believe in your life and my life, God, if, we're, if we are, are being intentional, God will orchestrate chemistry, but, but we have to be intentional about looking at that. As somebody said, and I mentioned to you before, but if you want to have a friend, you need to be a friend. So we need to be intentional about, uh, about those kinds of relationships. The third thing, the third element is that we need to be honest. Share the last 10%. Now, in chapter 19 and uh, uh, verses 1 through 5, we read here that Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. And I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak to him about you, and I will tell you what I find out. And Jonathan, verse 4, spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has, he has not wronged you, but and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life into his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Now, you, you, you find here that, that Jonathan was, was confronting his, his, his father because his father had gotten angry and realized basically he'd gotten jealous because David was being acclaimed as, uh, as this great hero. And, and, and Saul, uh, you know, the, you, you, as you read the, the scripture there, was troubled in spirit, and, and it seemed like that uh, an evil spirit would come upon him and he would try to kill David. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. And when, when crisis comes, friends arrive. In, uh, in chapter uh, 20 and verses 1 through 4, we read this. Uh, it'll not be on your screen, but it said, Then David fled from Naoth at, at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he'll be greatly grieved. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. And Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times and a brother 
is born in a time of adversity. And I think that crisis, when crisis comes, it often reveals, have you noticed who your true friends are? Because when crisis comes, a lot of people that you thought were your friends don't show up. They, 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 uh, they, they are, are uh, conspicuously absent. But when crisis comes, there's a cost. And when crisis comes, there's a sacrifice. And when crisis comes, true friends show up and they ask the question, what can I do? And that's what Jonathan said. Tell me, what, what can I do for you? The, the next is that we need to be loyal. Don't shrink back when things heat up. In, uh, in, in, in chapter 20, uh, we begin to read further there that uh, David says to Jonathan, uh, basically that, uh, you know, there's going to be a feast your father's going to have and, and um, tell him that I, can't, I couldn't show up because I had to go to Bethlehem for a feast, an annual feast with my family and so forth. And if he, if he doesn't say anything, then everything is okay. But if he gets angry, you'll know that he's still trying to kill me. And so uh, David and Jonathan kind of set up a little uh, way to, to signal what was going on. And, and, and so we, we, we read here that um, they, they, they basically were, uh, Jonathan was able to stand up for him again to his father and find out what was going on. And I think sometimes the reason we don't really have great friends is the price of loyalty is very, very high. And, and the reality is you don't betray your friends. And, and that, uh, that we find true with David and Jonathan. Uh, next, we know that you need to be vulnerable. Uh, refuse to let fear or pride limit your relationships. In chapter 20, again, when you read there where uh, when Jonathan found out his, da his dad, his father was really angry and, and certainly was still trying to find uh, uh, David. And, and so they, uh, they had this signal that Jonathan went out with his bow and arrow, shot an arrow out, and then told his, his, boy, his uh, aide to go, go with the arrow. And he, he said to David, if I tell him to go further, you'll know that my father is, is, is seeking to kill you. And, and that was the signal they used. And notice in verse 40 and 41, Jonathan sent the boy away. It says, after the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down, down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. You see, vulnerability is basically taking off a layer appropriately and wisely with safe, with safe people at the right time in the right way. We need to be vulnerable, but, but understand when I say that, we're not, we're not vulnerable with everyone, and we're not vulnerable all the time, but it really is the key to deep, authentic community. And then the seventh element there is that we need to be spiritual. We need to become basically a Romans 12 Christian every day in every way. In, um, in chapter 23, uh, verses 15 through 18, we read, And Saul's uh, son Jonathan went to David at Horish, and notice this, and helped him find strength in God. Verse 17, he said, Don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I'll be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And our number one goal in our friendship is to help our friend, that person, to become a Romans 12 Christian in every, uh, every day in every way. Help them to trust God. Help them to obey God's word. Help them to do the right thing. Help them to realize that God is in control. Amen. Help them to realize that God's going to come through. That's the goal of friendship. We see Jonathan here that goes to David and say, the scripture says that, that he helped to strengthen him uh, before the Lord, to find strength in God. He encouraged him and, and so forth. That is is what we are to do uh, as, as friends as well. The second thing that we notice is that David and Jonathan's covenant with God was really their, the, the basis of their devotion to one another. Now, folks, you don't have the power to have that kind of devotion in, in a relationship apart from Christ in you. As a matter of fact, Jesus models this 
In John chapter 15, verses 9 through 13, notice what the words of our Lord. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here we notice at the very last time that Jesus is with his disciples. This is the, the night before he is, he is betrayed and, and arrested and, and his crucifixion and so forth that, that uh, Jesus starts here as he talks to his disciples with his relationship with the Father. He says, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And then he tells them to do the same thing. He says, love each other as I have loved you. For greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Do you get it? You can't love apart from experiencing it with your heavenly Father. It starts there. We understand his love for us. Our covenant with God will determine the level of our devotion with other people. Your walk with God will determine your depth with other people. It's just the way it is. People who have a shallow relationship with God will have shallow relationships with people. Why? Because they don't have the capacity to trust, to give, or to be vulnerable. You can be vulnerable if you're secure in Christ. You can be honest and face rejection and even tell the last 10% if you know that God's got you covered. If you don't, you feel like you got to manipulate and you got to play games and that happens too much in our relationships. And it happens, could I say it this way? It happens too much in the church as well. The third thing that we notice here is that Jonathan and David's relationship reveals that authentic community occurs when the real you meets real needs for the right reason in the right way. Let's go back and take a look in, in um, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, which is basically our text for this morning from Romans 12. Notice what the Word of God says from the New American Standard Bible. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Check out what the message uh, says in, uh, in these verses. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. <laughs> Run for dear life from evil. Hold on to dear life for good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians to be inventive in hospitality. Folks, hear me this morning when I say authentic community is the core of Christianity. Maybe I could say it this way. Authentic community is at the very heart of who we are to be as the church. Amen? Amen. And, and we need to have that kind of a relationship one with another. In John chapter 17, Jesus, in praying to the Father on the night just before he, he's, uh, he's to be arrested, he says there in chapter 17, verse 21, he says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus' prayer, Jesus' great concern as he prayed this high priestly prayer to his, to his heavenly father the night before, he's, just before he's, he was arrested, he says, Father, may they be one. Listen this morning. God's desire for us as the people of God is that there be a unity, that we be one in Christ Jesus, that there be authentic community in our relationship. May they, he says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Listen, that's how the world is to know that we are the people of God, is that we love one another as he loved us. Amen? Amen. So the question this morning is, 
How can you experience authentic community? So notice what our text there in Romans 12, 9 to 13 tells us. It tells us that authentic community occurs when the real you meets real needs for the right reason in the right way. Now, the real you basically means that you are authentic. He says, love must be sincere or love must be without hypocrisy. It also means that there is purity. He says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Because you see, the world, as we talked before in, in, in Romans 12 too, the world is seeking to squeeze us into its own mold. And we often find that the lines are being blurred by our culture so that the scripture, as the scripture says there and from the message, we are to run from dear, for dear life from evil and hold on to dear life to the good. The real needs requires devotion. The scripture tells us there to be devoted to one another in brotherly love and humility, giving preference to one another in honor, or as the message states it, practice playing second fiddle. Nobody likes to play second fiddle. We want, you know, we want to be up front, right? But the scripture tells us basically that we are to, we are to seek to be humble one, one uh, to another. And then the right reason requires that our motive be pure, not, not lagging behind in diligence, never lacking in zeal, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. Hear me. We are to do what we do for the Lord. The, 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 the problem is, so oftentimes we burn out in the church when we do what we do from duty rather than our love for God. We, we tend to lose sight of why we do what we do. And I, I you know, as a pastor uh, and, 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 and watching people and people getting burnt out, I, I, I had a, a very dear friend in, one, in my last church uh, that uh, when I went there, and, you know, he, was, uh, he and his wife were having Bible study and they were, you know, they were just, and, and people were coming to the Lord. I mean, they were inviting people, not just church people, but people from the community. And, and I, I was there, I've been there when, when, when people were finding the Lord. But after a period of time, they kind of got tired. And he said, Pastor, I'm kind of burnt out. But you know what happened is he forgot why he was doing it. It became a duty rather than an opportunity to, to, to display the love of God. And, and, and as a result of that, you know, it, he, missed, he missed out on, that, on that, uh, that wonderful ministry that he had there. And I, I think so oftentimes for many of us, we begin to do what we do because we feel like we're obligated to do it rather than for our love for God and our love for other people. Amen? You, you understand what I'm talking about? So the right way then reminds us that we need to have an upward focus. He talks about there in, 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 that, in our passage to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction or tribulation, faithful in prayer. But we also have not only an, a, an, an upward focus, we have to have an outward focus because he talks about sharing with God's people who are in, in need and practice or pursue hospitality. You see, <clears throat> there's a danger that we love with words and emotions rather than with deeds and truth. We need to make sure that we're loving in the way we live and the things that we're doing. In other words, we are to be the church. I like what Chip Ingram states in his book, let's stop going to church and let's be the church. May God help us to stop just going to church. Let's seek to be the church. Our world needs to see the church as a place where authentic, where we, there is authentic community by the grace of God. Amen? that there is something about being together with the people of God. And we're not coming out of duty. We're not just going to church. We're not just going through the motions, but, but we can be the church. May God help us to be the church. Our church, our, our, our world needs that more than anything else. This morning, we're going to share here in just a, just a, a, a few moments, um, in our, in our time of communion. And uh, as, we, as we do so, we're going to share together as the people of God. Now, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about the fact that, and, and, and talks about the fact that the, the Christians in Corinth, that there was division within the church. And, and, and sometimes we read that and when he talks about taking 
the elements of communion in, a, in an unworthy way. We, we, uh, we kind of, you know, think of it in terms of maybe there's sin in our life. And uh, obviously we need to look at our lives in that. But Paul is actually saying that their sin was coming before God as a divided body. That there was division within the church. And Paul says that because of that, they'll be judged. And so uh, I, I think we need to, to, to realize that Paul is, is talking here, and, and, and I believe talking to us, that as a Christian community, we come together for, for communion. We're not simply coming to eat and drink together, as it were. Uh, we're not uh, you know, simply just remembering a past event and, and even confessing our, our, our sins, but we are demonstrating the very heart of the gospel which is to recognize the shared humanity of each of us that we're united in love as the body of Christ, each with our own gifts and our own convictions, but we're one in the body of Christ. We're one in the church. And, and, and so I, I want us this morning, we're going to share communion. And, and in a moment, I'm going to have uh, the ladies that are going to help us and they're going to come and hold the, uh, the trays with the communion elements. And we're going to intentionally ask you this morning to come forward because I want us to do it as a body, that we're coming to receive the elements. And, and, and as we take them back this morning, and as we, as we, we take uh, the, 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 the bread that represents the broken body, to realize that we come as sinners saved by grace, by the grace of God, and, and we take that bread representing the broken body of our Lord that Jesus, when he died upon the cross and he suffered there, he did so for you and for me. And when we take the cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ to realize that, that as we share that cup that we are, we're sharing and remembering the blood that was shed upon the cross for your sins and my sins. And the scripture says without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And, and to realize this morning that, that we, we, we have life because Jesus gave his blood. He became the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. But the beauty this morning is that we share this together. Amen? Amen. We are one. And could I just maybe say something else here? If you're here this morning and you've got some issue with somebody else in the church, I think it'd be a good opportunity for you maybe to sit down with them and say, hey, listen, we need to clear this up. We need to take care of this, whatever it is. I don't know. I, I'm just throwing that out there because I, I just want us to realize this morning that we are sharing together in the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as believers saved by grace. Amen. Now, here in the Church of the Nazarene, we, we, don't, we don't believe you have to be a member of our church uh, to receive communion. We do. Uh, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we invite you to, be, uh, to join with us. We want you. We, we, we desire for, for us to share together in this time of communion. So, ladies, if you would come, and as we prepare this morning, I want us to do so as we wait upon the Lord. And I would invite you this morning, if you would, um, to come forward. Let me have one. I'm sorry. Would you just stand where you are and just come forward and receive the elements this morning and uh, take those. And take it back to your seat. And we'll share it together. I'll give you instructions in just a moment as we, as we share together.
as you've received, I, I would just, in a way of direction to, again, reiterate, we're going to open the, the top that has the bread first. Don't open the juice first or we'll have problems. But uh, would you just open the top and take out that, um, that little cracker that's in there? And this morning, as we receive this together as the body of Christ, we remember that Jesus suffered for our sins, for your sins, for mine. And it is by his stripes that we are healed. And we receive this this morning with thanksgiving. Let's take it and eat it. Remembering that Christ died for you and for me. Then if you would open the juice portion. And this morning as we drink this, it symbolizes to us the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he shed his blood, became the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, your sins and mine. And we drink it this morning with thanksgiving. Our Heavenly Father, we come, O oh God, as the body of Christ, realizing that uh, despite all of our differences, despite, dear Lord, the fact that we come from different areas of life, we have different life experiences, but Lord, the one thing we have in common this morning is that we who were sinners have been saved by the grace of God through the broken body of Jesus upon the cross and through his blood that was shed for my sins, for each of our sins this morning. And Lord, as we have gone through this simple act that was instituted by you with your disciples and told that we are to do this in remembrance, we do so, O oh God, as the people of God. And we give you praise and honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, that we are one in the bond of love. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Let's sing. The words will be on the screen here. The words of this uh, course that Lloyd has been playing. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond. God. Isn't it great to be a part of the family of God? And for what God has done for us, we give him all praise, all honor, and all glory. Our worship team is going to come back up and lead us in a closing song. I uh, think while, while they are coming, I, uh, I mentioned to most of you board members, I'd like to have a, a quick meeting afterwards. I'd sit down here at the front. Let's meet in Morford, give you about five or ten minutes of visiting time, and then meet with me back there for just a moment. Uh, Pastor, from your sermon this morning, I just figured something out. Samuel had to go through a bunch of brothers to get to a David. You get it? We've gone through a bunch of candidates, and we're going to get to a David when God opens the right door. Well, I think we should go out victorious this morning. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious
precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he fought me. Somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. story and some sweet day I'll sing of them the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love with God this week. We will see you next Sunday. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever.